Good day, grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson in mathematics. And we are continuing with probability um, today in this lesson. So we're going to speak about, um, we've spoken about independent events and I've lost a question. How weird. Okay. So <laughs> I don't know what happened to one of my questions. Okay, so let's just carry on with independent events, dependent, independent events. Um, there was a question that I wanted to do with you guys, but it's fine. I will happily do it with you guys later. Okay, so let's talk about dependent versus independent events. So it's, it, these are easier to calculate. These are quite easy to calculate because the definition of events, whether independent or dependent are two events, A and B, are independent and if and only if the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. Okay, so let's do an example. You got a bag contains five red balls and five green balls. Okay, so you've got this bag and it contains five red balls. One, two, three, four, five. And it has five green balls. One, two, three, four, and five. Okay, we remove a random ball from the bag, note its color, then return it to the bag and then remove another ball and note its color. Okay, so in other words, we're not decreasing the number of balls every time. We pick a ball out, we say, ah, oh, look, it's red. Okay, put it back in and we pull it out and go, oh, look, it's red again or it's green or whatever. Okay, the point is that is what we're doing. We're doing it twice. We're pulling out a random ball, putting it back, checking out its color, putting it back, doing it again. Okay, now it says, what is the probability that the first ball is red? Well, if you think about it, we've got five balls that are red out of a total of 10 balls, so the probability is one half or 50%, okay? The probability that the first ball being red would be 50%. What is the probability the second ball is green is going to be exactly the same probability because there are five balls that are green, so you've got a 50-50% chance, 50-50 chance, whether you've got going to pull out a red ball or a green ball, okay? But now they say, what is the probability that the first ball is red and then the second ball is green, okay? So the probability of the first ball being red and the second ball being green would just be the multiplication of the two. It's 5 over 10 multiplied by 5 over 10, which is then 25 over 100, which is a quarter. So you've got a 25% chance of your first ball being red and your second ball being green. Now it says, and this is the part where we get into, is the fact that the first ball is red and the second ball is green independent? Okay, independent. So this is the rule. Remember the definition. The probability of A and B has to equal the probability of A times the probability of B. But we know the probability of A times the probability of B is a quarter. We've done it already. It's 5 over 10 times 5 over 10, which equals a quarter, right? So we're going to go through it again. The probability of the first ball being red is half. The probability of the second ball being green is a half. So the probability of the first rule the first red and second green is a quarter, but a half times a half is a quarter, so the events are independent. So if the probability of A and B, okay, is equal to the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B, then we can say that obviously the events are independent. Okay, right, let's look at another example. I mean, let's look at contingency tables. So contingency tables are just another tool that we can use to solve probability problems. So an example would be, what is the probability that a learner from grade 11 has a cell phone? What is the probability the learner does not have a cell phone from grade 11? And are the grade, where is, I'm sorry, there's something wrong with my PowerPoint. Let me go look at something here. There's something very wrong. Oh, you see, look at that. My pictures aren't being displayed. I thought I was going mad. I wasn't going mad. Okay, let's just close this down. I thought I was going mad. I'm gonna open it up again. <sighs> there it is. That's the question I wanted to go through with you guys. I thought I was going mad. Okay, let me just sideshow from, let's go from here. 
from Karen's side. There it is. Hooray. Okay, I thought I was going mad. Okay, so this is the question that we stopped on yesterday. Okay, and I said that I would get back to you on it because I felt that it would take a little bit of explanation. And it does take, it's a very quick and easy calculation, but it does take a bit of explanation because we haven't done this before. I'm sorry about that. It's for some reason, the PowerPoint wasn't showing these pictures, which is very weird. Okay, so now it says, if you throw two dice at the same time, the probability that a six will be shown on one of the dice is 10 out of 36. Okay, how do they get that? Okay, well, if you think about it, and I'm just going to draw them um, as little blocks. Okay, so do you agree that you could have one on this one and you could have two? Well, let's just go through all of them. We can go, I'm going to draw the numbers one and six. You could have two and six. You could have three and six. You could have four and six. You could have five and six, and then you could have six and six, okay? So that there is one, two, three, four, five, six times. But then there's also the probability that you could have six and one, six and two, six and three, six and four, and six and five, which will give you another um, four, which gives you 10 out of 36. So out of the 36 times that you, 36 possibilities that you can have, 10 of them will be that there will be a six shown on one of the dice. The probability that a six will be shown on both dice is only one out of 36. Do you agree? Okay, let me just explain. We've got one and six, two and six, three and six, four and six, five and six and six and six, right? So that there is one, six times. Then you can have six and one, six and two, six and three, six and four and six and five. So it's gonna give you 10 out of 36. But you're only gonna have the possibility of only having one out of 36 once. Okay, now it says, what is the probability that a six will not show? on either of the dice when you throw two dice at the same time. Okay, so do you agree that the probability, we're looking at the probability of not getting a six. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at the probability of not getting a six. So if you want to think about it, if you want to do it, okay, we can say, if we say the probability of A, let's say is uh, 0, 0,5, no, let's make it 0, 0,4, 0, 0,4, the probability of not getting A would be 1 minus 0, 0.4, which is 0, 0.6. Okay, do you understand that? If I've got two options, I've got A or not getting A, my probability of getting A would be 0, 0.4. The probability of not getting A would be 1, because 1 is a whole, it's a total. Okay, it's like 100%, 1 is a whole. It'd be 1 minus 0, 0.4, which would be 0, 0.6. Or if you want to think about it this way, the probability of getting A would be 40%. Therefore, the probability of not getting A would be 60%, right? But now we're doing it in fractions. So now the probability of not getting a 6 would be equal to 1 minus, but now we're going to talk about these two. So there's a probability of getting 1 6, but we want no 6s, okay? So 1 6 would be 10 out of 36, plus the probability of getting both sixes, which is one out of 36. Okay, so what does that become? It becomes one minus, that is 36, and then that is 11. Okay, which becomes 36 minus 11, which is 25 over 36. So there you can see the probability of not getting a six is 25 over 36. Okay, now, now we can move on to independent events, which I've already spoken to you about. Sorry, I was just really upset because I had planned this lesson in my head and then things were just not the way it should be. Okay, so two events, A and B are independent and, and, and we've gone through this, okay? So we've said, we've got the probability of the red ball, probability of green, nothing changes, we've gone through it, okay? Now let's talk about this question. This is a bit different. It says, it's just a different way of stating a question, okay? It says we are given that probability of W is 0 0.4 and the probability of T is 0 0.3. 
three five. Okay, and it says the probability of T and W is naught point one four. And it says what what is the chances or are these events W and T mutually exclusive? Give a reason for your answer. And then we're going to talk about are the events W and T independent? Give a reason for your answer. Okay. Now, let's have a look at this. So if something is mutually exclusive, then the probability of T and W would have to equal zero, okay? So that would be if it was mutually, mutually exclusive. But if you look at this question, in other words, oh my word, I can't write today. Okay, so let's just erase this. Okay, mutually exclusive. Um, Exclusive. In other words, we're saying, can you have both events happen? Is there an intersection? Can you have both events happen? And yes, you can have both events happen in this case. The probability of both events happening is not comma one four. Okay. So are these events mutually exclusive? No, they're not. And why? Because the probability of T and W does not equal zero. That's my answer for that. Now it says, are the events W and T independent? Okay, so let's talk about that. We've got a little calculation to do. We know that the probability of T and W is 0,14. They gave it to us. Okay, that's 0,14. Right, now let's work out the probability of W multiplied by the probability of t, because if these are equal, then we can say they're independent, okay? But if they're not equal, then they're not independent. So the probability of w is 0,4 multiplied by the probability of t, which is 0,35. And what we need to do then is get out our calculator, and we go 0.4, multiplied by 0.35 and that becomes 7 over 50 which is 0.14 yay so you can see that they are equal therefore w and t are independent events so t does not depend on w or vice versa so therefore w and t are independent so the answer would be yes and this is your reason. Okay, right, now we were talking contingency tables and there is my little table and I'm not happy because you can see the table. Okay, so like I said, this is another tool used to solve probability problems. So we've got grade 11s, grade 12s and a total. So you can see that we've got a total of kids of 109 kids a total of 109 kids have a cell phone, okay? Of those, 59 are in grade 11 and 50 are grade 12, okay? We have nine kids that don't have any cell phones. There's six in grade 11 and three in grade 12. The total number of grade 11s is 65, and the total number of grade 12s is 53, and the total number of students is 118. Okay, so you need to be able to read these tables. So you need to be very careful about how these tables work. Okay, so now it says, what is the probability that a learner from grade 11 has a cell phone? So what we need to do is look at the number of learners in total in grade 11, that'll be 65. And how many of them have a cell phone is 59. So do you agree the probability is 59 over 65 that a learner in grade 11 will have a cell phone. Now it says, what is the probability the learner who, uh, the learner who does not have a cell phone is from grade 11, okay? So a learner that does not have a cell phone is in grade 11 would be six out of 65. So that's gonna be six out of 65. Now it says, are the grade of a learner and whether or not he has a cell phone or not independent events? Explain your answer. So we've spoken about that one. Okay, let's, okay, we've spoken about this. Okay, now, are the grade of a learner and whether he has a cell phone or not independent events? Okay, 
So to test for independence, we need to consider whether a learner is in grade 11 and whether a learner has a cell phone. Okay, so that would be what we're looking at. We're looking at whether or not the grade is learner is in grade 11, for example, and whether or not he has a cell phone. Or we could do grade 12 and a cell phone, but let's do grade 11 and a cell phone. So the probability that a learner is in grade 11 is 65 out of 118. We've got 65 grade 11s, and out of them, 118, I mean, out of 118 total students, okay? So the probability that a learner is in grade 11 is 65 out of 118. The probability that a learner has a cell phone is 109 out of 118. Okay. The probability that a learner is in grade 11 and has a cell phone is going to be 59 out of 118, which is one half. Okay, do you see that? Because there it is. There are the number of grade 11s out of the total that have a cell phone and are in grade 11. So if we multiply these two together, because that's what we'd have to have, the probability of them being in grade 11 and the probability of them having a cell. If we multiply these two together, it would have to equal the probability of them being in grade 11 and having a cell. So you can see that that is a half. This is 65 over 180 multiplied by 109 over 818. And there's no way in hell that that is equal to a half. But you know what, I'll actually prove it to you. We're gonna use our calculator. We're gonna say 65 over 118 multiplied by another fraction, 109 over 118. Mm -mm. Mm -mm, again, oh my word, one, eight, and we move it and we go equals, and you can see that that is definitely, well, it's 0 0.51, it's not equal to exactly a half, and it has to be equal to exactly a half, so therefore we can see that the grade of the learner and whether or not he has a cell phone are dependent because they are not equal. Right, now let's talk about the fundamental counting principle. Okay, now the fundamental counting principle is a part of the um, probability that actually is the new work in grade 12 as far as I remember. So let's talk about it. Okay, and this is to talk about your options, okay? So let's say you have successive choices are made from M1, M2, M3 to Mn. Then the amount of combined options of product is M1 times M2 times N3, dot, 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 times Mn. So that is very theoretical, and I'm going to explain it to you in a second, okay? So for example, if I communicate with my friend by letter, email, or telephone, and he communicates back by telephone or email. There are six possible ways of communicating. In other words, this is me, and this is my friend with spiky hair, okay? And she's a girl. Okay, so now I can send her a letter, okay, old-fashioned letter, or I can send her an email, or I can send, I can phone her. Okay, tring, tring. She can contact me via the telephone, her own telephone, tring, tring, or she can send me an email. Apparently, her postman doesn't work. Okay, post box doesn't work. Okay, so do you agree that the ways of communicating, if I asked you how many ways there were to communicate, there would be one, two, three from my side and two from her side. So there's six possible ways. How do we get that? Let me show you, just to give you an example. Okay, so let's call this, okay, so it's envelope. Um, okay, let's not call it envelope. Let's call it letter, email, telephone. And she's just got, e mm, let's change color. And she's got email and telephone. Okay, right. So do you agree that I could send her a letter and she could send me an email back? That's one. I could send her a letter and she could phone me back. That's two. Three, I could send her an email and she could email me back. Four, I could send her an email and she could phone me back. Five, I could phone her and she could email me back. 
and six, I could phone her and she could phone me back. So do you see that there are six ways that we can communicate? Okay, do you understand that? And that is what this is talking about. So when we're talking about the fundamental counting principle, we're talking about this type of thing. We're talking about all the ways that we can work out the combined options. So let's do another example. A boy buying a sandwich finds that he can choose between white, brown and whole wheat bread. Okay, how many choices do we have? We have three. Okay, he can choose chicken, cheese, tuna or roast beef as a filler. Okay, one, two, three or four. Lettuce, tomato or radish as a garnish. So that's one, two and three. He can choose his sandwich to be toasted or plain. That's two. And it says how many different sandwiches can he order? So do you agree his options are three times four times three times two? And I'm not going to go through this all again, okay? So he has 72 possible different sandwiches that he can order. And that's actually, this is the basis in which a lot of the restaurants work on. The fact that people will be given these options, so they end up with a whole bunch of different meals that they can order, and they don't feel um, restricted and actually using not a lot of ingredients. Okay, so now let's talk about permutations. And this is about how you can arrange your data. Okay, so it says, how many ways can I arrange six different books on a shelf? Okay, so let's think about it. We're going to make a box. Okay, let's make a box. Okay, so let's make a box. Okay, and we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay. So now, do you agree that if I want to arrange the books, six different books in a way, let's call them A, B, C, and D, okay? E and F, <laughs> okay, right. Do you agree I could arrange it like this? I could arrange A, B, C, D, E, and F. I could then take my A and move it over and then go B, A, C, D, E, and F. I then could make my A go in this direction and go B, C, A, D, E, F. Okay, so do you get, agree that I can take my A and place it in six different places? Okay, so that's where my six comes from. That means that B can be placed in five different places. Okay, C can be placed in four different places. D can be placed in three different places. E can be placed in two different places and F is placed in one different place. Okay, so that leaves me with six times five times four times three times two times one, which is 720 different ways that I could arrange my six different books on a shelf. Okay, but that six times five times four times three times two times one is called six factorial. So if I say n factorial, I mean that I need to multiply n with n minus 1 with n minus 2 with all the way down to 1. So that there is n factorial. It's the multiples of all the numbers that, I mean, it's multiplying all the numbers that make up that number. Okay, so now let's talk about arranging a selection of objects. Okay, so now I'm arranging a specific amount of books. Okay, so let's say, for example, I have got nine different books. How many ways can I arrange five of them in a shelf? So again, we made a box. Okay, so we want to arrange five of them. Okay, so it doesn't matter which five we do, but do you agree, just as in the previous one, the first book that you arrange, you're going to have nine different ways to arrange, okay, the first book. The second book, you're going to have eight ways to rearrange. The third book, you're going to have seven, etc. But I'm only arranging five of them. The other four, I don't care which order they're in. Okay, which means I'm only looking at nine, eight, seven, six, and five. So the solution, Okay, you could either go, okay, well, it's going to be 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5. Okay, that's fine. But here's the thing, okay, do you understand that if I do that, if I do that, that would mean be fine for this question because this question is quite a small question. Okay, right. But imagine if I said I had... 9,323 books and I'm only arranging 5,624 of them. Okay. 
<laughs> the permutation they are now quite a lot bigger. So then we don't really want to be going 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5. We actually want to be using the rule. And the rule is this. We take the n factorial of the total number of books, which in this case is 9. And then we say, okay, fine, we're arranging five of them. So we're going to disregard four of them. So we're going to divide by four factorial. So that is what we've got. We've got nine factorial divided by four factorial. And I'm going to show you how to do that on your calculator so that you can see. Admittedly, you guys are going to have to look for factorials on your calculators, but mine's over there. It's a little X with an exclamation mark, okay? So we're going to go fraction, and I'm going to go nine, shift, factorial over and it doesn't mean nine exclamation mark you say it is a factorial nine factorial over four factorial and then you go equals and that's 15,120 so that equals 15,120 and just to prove my point just to prove my point I'm gonna go nine times eight times seven times six times 5 equals 15,120. So you could have just multiplied these out, like I said, but if you've got something really this big, you really want to know that you can just use this formula here. And we write it like this, where we say we want the probability of five things out of nine. Okay, the probability of rearranging five things out of nine. Okay, so it is a total number factorial over 9 minus the number of things that we want to arrange factorial. Okay, so let's look at another example. We've got the letters which make mkumkutu. Okay, right. And it says, how many ways can I arrange the letters of the words? Okay, so yeah, let's think about this, okay? The reason we're thinking about this is how many letters are there in total? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They're eight. So it's going to be eight factorial over something. And remember, it is going to be eight minus something else. But there's another way to look at it, okay? And let's just talk about that. How many M's do you agree have? Do you agree we've got one, two M's? Okay. How many K's do we have? We've got one, two K's. Okay, we've got K, we've got two. How many U's do we have? We've got one, two, three. So the U's are three. And how many T's do we have? We've got T is a one. So do you agree that the way that we're going to do this is we've got a total number of eight letters that we can arrange, but there are a couple that are doubled up, okay? Obviously, then what, so what we're going to do is we're going to divide by the fact that there's two factorial for the two Ms, there's two factorial for the Ks, there's three factorial for the Us, and you could really divide by one factorial because the T, but let's get real, one factorial is just one. So what were we doing? We're saying that out of the eight letters, unfortunately, the M's are doubled up, the K's are doubled up, the U's are doubled up, so that reduces the number of ways that we can arrange the letters of the word, okay? Because of the fact that it's taking into account the fact that you will see it three, twice or three times, okay? Um, so that becomes, okay, so that becomes, and you could think of it another way of doing this as well. You can go 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 over 2 times 1 times 2 times 1 times 3 times 2 times 1. So these three cancel with that. 2 times 2 cancels with this and you're left with eight times seven times six times five, and you will see that that is four. And how many letters do you actually have? One, two, three, four. So there you can see that you're actually getting to the same answer. You're getting eight minus the four to give you the four again. Okay, right, but let's carry on. So let's do this on a calculator. Um, so if your calculator doesn't have a factorial, which I'll be very seriously doubt, then you can work it out like this. However, the better way to do it is to go 8 shift factorial divided by 2 shift factorial, 2 shift factorial, and then finally 3 
shift factorial move it over equals oh i had a syntax error okay um let me try it again let me try it again let me do it the other way eight times seven times six times five equals 1680 so this equals 1680 and i think i might have printed it on the page there you go so that there is how you can work out how to arrange letters if they've been doubled up okay so now let's look at poor old rian okay and rian packs his suitcase for his holiday with three caps five shirts three pairs of jeans and two pairs of tackies, okay? It says, how many different outfits can he put on if when he dresses, he must wear a shirt, a pair of jeans, a pair of tackies, and a cap. So caps, shirts, pair of jeans, and tackies. So he has to wear one of each something, okay, right. So this one's pretty easy because what are we looking at? You've got three options with the caps, multiplied with five options with the shirts, multiplied with three options with a pair of jeans and two options this man packs more than i do when he go on holiday when i go on holiday okay so if we multiply this out uh three times two is six and five times three is 15 and 15 times six is 90. okay so he's got 90 different outfits depending on what he chooses with regards to caps etc okay now Poor old Rian again. Let's pick on him again. This time, we're talking about how he would do this, okay? He hangs all five shirts and three pairs of jeans, each item separately, on a different hanger. On the rail in the cupboard, it says, how many different arrangements are there for his clothing? Well, do you agree he's got five shirts and three pairs of jeans? So how many items of clothing do you have? He's got five plus three items of clothing right so if that's the case he's got eight items of clothing which means that he's going to have eight factorial ways of arranging his clothing because remember he's going to have he's going he could do one shirt and then three jeans and the rest of the shirts he could do one jean one shirt and the rest of the clothes you can do etc etc so it works out to be eight times seven times six and each item has got that many number of possibilities that can be rearranged and it works out to be eight factorial and we go pop that in our calculator shift oh no let's try again eight shift factorial equals 40,320 so he's got 40,320 ways that he could arrange his clothes. Okay, and I need to say to you that this gives you an idea of um, looking for bank codes and bank cards, okay? Let's say that you are just, and just to totally separate like, this thing out, let's say that they tell you that you can use a four digit number as your bank card code okay and that all the numbers must be different then do you agree that you have got four factorial possibilities for your numbers the so just i mean very basically assuming that you can choose four numbers okay so then i'm not talking about the fact that it's out of 10 decimal places and everything else i mean 10 numbers okay so just if we can choose between one two three and four okay it is going to be four times three times two times one four times three is 12 times by two is 24. so there's 24 options for just if you had to arrange these four numbers okay in any order and no repeats okay so four three two one three four two one etc etc okay uh three two four one three two one four okay so there are 24 different ways that you can arrange just those four numbers now imagine and we will do some calculations on this later imagine if we now said okay fine you don't have to use those four numbers you can use all 10 numbers okay but you have to arrange for them. In fact, we can work this out. We've done it already. This is the same as those nine books and you're arranging four of them. So what happens is we've got 10 factorial, 
Why is it 10? Because it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. You can use all those digits for any of the places, okay, but you're only arranging four of them. So it becomes 10 minus 4 factorial, which becomes 10 factorial over 6 factorial. So just to make that easy for us, it becomes 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times <gasps> times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, all divided by 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Those cancel with those. And here it is, we're assuming no repeats. We're assuming no repeats. Okay, obviously this becomes a much bigger number if you can have repeats, and you can have repeats. You could choose 0, 0, 0, 0, but we'll worry about that later. So just assuming there's no repeats, and you've got all these 10 digits that you can choose between, and you have to arrange for them. So let's get out our calculator and just work that out. So we've got 10 times 9 times 8 times 7. So the number of combinations without any repeats is 5,040, 5,040. So in other words, if some person has to pick up your card and you've used four different numbers, any four different numbers from zero through to nine and you haven't had any repeats, there is a one in 5,040 chance that if they don't know you, they will guess your number correctly. Okay, why do I say they don't know you? Because if they do know you, there might be something about you that gives an idea as to what your number will be, because some people use their birth dates, or etc, etc, okay? But if they don't know you, they pick up your card, and you've just chosen four random numbers, all different, from zero through to nine for your four digit code, they have a one in 5,040 chance of getting that number right. So at least then you can see that it's actually quite good. Now obviously that changes if you're allowed to double up, which you are allowed to do when you choose a bank code, okay? You could choose one, 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 or for example. Okay, but we will talk about those odds later. Okay, let's look at another quick, last question for the day. Let's look at dear old Rian again, okay? He packs his suitcase for his holiday with three caps. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, it says, what is the probability that all the shirts are all hanging together next to each other? Remember that he was hanging up five shirts and three pairs of jeans, okay? And then it says, what is the probability of him hanging up all five, all five shirts together? Okay, so do you agree that you've got the total number of arrangements could be, okay, remember there's three piece, pairs of jeans, right? So if you had to think about this, there is actually really just four things, okay? There could be five shirts and then one, two, three pairs of jeans, or we could have five shirts and one, two, three pairs of jeans, or we could have five shirts and one, two, three pairs of jeans, um, or we could have five shirts and one, two, three pairs of jeans. Okay, so the total number of arrangements, do you agree, is going to be four factorial, okay, multiplied by, that's that arrangement, okay, five factorial, multiplied by the number of ways that you can arrange the shirts. And that's going to be 5 factorial, okay? So that works out to be 2,880, okay? So the way, number of ways that you can arrange the shirts is 4 factorial multiplied by 5 factorial, which is 2,880. Now, the probability of this happening is going to be 4 factorial, let me just say it, it's going to be 4 factorial multiplied by 5 factorial over 8 factorial, okay? Which is going to be what? It is going to be 4 times 5 factorial over 8 factorial. If I do that in my calculator, let's see if I can do it in my calculator and it doesn't spit it out. It's going to be 4 shift factorial multiplied by 5 shift factorial all over 
8 shift factorial. Oh, that's what I'm going to have to delete, 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 delete. Shift factorial. Dish. My calculator might spit this out. We'll see. Oh, it doesn't like it at all. Okay, so let's work it out. Let's make it easier for ourselves. So 4 factorial is going to be 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 multiplied by 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 all over 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 those all don't work I mean cancel so we're left with 4 3 2 and 1 which is going to be 24 over 8 7 6 so we can just work out 8 times 7 times 6 which is 336 okay um so that equals hang on i'm going to get there 224 divided um, let's try again delete 24 divided by 336 no delete 36 equals let me get there 1 in 14 or no comma no 7 but let's leave it as 1 over 14 so it's a 1 in 14 probability that he will have all the shirts hanging together next to each other in the cupboard a 1 in 14 chance right grade um 12 so let's call it a day for today and i hope that you'll join me tomorrow and we will talk some more about probability go through some more exam paper questions not a lot i don't think let me see one two okay and then we're going to start on exam revision and we're starting with paper one exam revision have a wonderful day cheers